Hi, everybody, and welcome to Good Vibes FC. I'm Sam Lewis. I'm coming to you from the Women's Game World Headquarters in Vermont. I'm Becky Sauerbrunn, and I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon. Becky, how the heck are you? You know, I, I'm good. I'm good. You know, my cat actually, Missy, has developed this limp, and it only happens sometimes. And I'm wondering if she's, like, weaponizing it, because every time she does, I immediately, like, throw all this affection to her. But I also think I might have to take her to the vet, and she does not handle the vet well. So I think I'd have to, like, kitty Xanax her oh, to make gosh. her cool enough to be able to get evaluated by a vet. So I'm I'm a little stressed about that. Oh, my gosh. That does sound stressful. Don't babies do that when they, they like, fake cry to get attention? I, I don't know. I don't know a lot about small humans. Me yeah. neither. Well, anyways, I I have to go way out of order today. I just I'm like fiending for my olipop now, and I can't wait till the gut check to open it. So I'm gonna crack right in. Cheers, cheers, Reba. I'm having a vintage cola today. I'm going with my tried and true strawberry vanilla. Freaking love that. Well, let me tell you about something really cool I did this weekend. I did. Pat did. My husband Pat is in the food industry here in Vermont. He's taking this farmer training program through UVM. He was doing pop up sandwich like events all last year when we were living in Boston. And he just did one again this past weekend at this local coffee shop that has like this fully decked out kitchen. He made smash burgers and veggie burgers and potato chips and zucchini salad and berries and cream for dessert. There was like 150 total sandwiches and people came through. Everybody came out to support. I was running food to tables, hamburgers in each hand, finding the number, bringing the food, saying hello Number 27, here's your order. Enjoy your food. And it was so much fun, Reba. It went really, really well, and I was just so proud of him. Oh, well done, Pat. I know. The Bear just came out a few days ago. Have you and Pat started to watch that? I've watched seasons one and two, but I have not caught up on season three yet, which is the new one. Have you been watching? It's like Zola and I just watched the first two episodes last night, and they're phenomenal. It's just oh so gosh. good. It's such a great show. I feel like I need to like set aside some me time to really just sit down and watch, which I'm excited about. I love the bear. So good. So good. You should have seen me like, you know how in the bear they like get really stressed and you're like, that's what kitchens are just like. But like Pat doesn't want his kitchen to ever be like that. So he is intentional about like staying very calm and like keeping order and like not letting the stress of the moment like get to him. But I kept like seeing the tickets print and I felt like they were like in my eye line. So I kept being like, tickets up, (laughs) tickets up. And he would be like, Sam, can you please like you're causing chaos when you say that. So please let me handle the expo. But I just wanted to be like carmy, like the like be up in there, like getting things out, you know, not the vibe that he was going for. No, not the vibe. But I do think I was helpful and I do think I did a good job and I learned a lot. But I was exhausted after it was like very taxing really does seem exhausting and i don't know if the bear just exacerbates that but watching that show at the end i feel emotionally strung out oh my gosh remember the christmas episode yes too well that i think people like have talked about like actually that was like you needed to like take an emotional break during that episode because it was like so stressful to even watch yeah my whoop like clocked it yeah just like clocked it so it like covers bodily metrics and stuff and my heart rate was elevated during that episode shut up yeah it was wild oh my god that is wild well okay switching topics a little bit becky when this episode comes out it's july 2nd pride month just wrapped up and we know that you did playing for pride we actually talked about that a little bit at the beginning of pride month of june so can you just remind us quickly what playing for pride is what you did and then tell us how much money you raised sure so I played for Pride, which it basically is a way to raise money for the LGBTQI plus community. And all the funds raised goes to Athlete Ally to continue their work to make sports more inclusive and more safe for everyone. So that could be educating coaches and teams on how their environments can be more inclusive. It can be targeting like really harmful legislation um, that I think we've seen in a lot of states right now. And I had a plan of raising around 5K. And I'm over halfway there. I still have to do my second half of the month donation. And I also am going to auction off my 
Thorns Pride Night Pride jersey. So game worn. I also have an armband that I will sign. I'll sign both of them. And so I'm going to do this like last minute surge and try to raise enough money to hit that 5K mark. So if you go to my page, if you go to my socials, click on there. If you donate, please add an email or a social media handle, something where I can contact you and organize me shipping this awesome jersey out to you. And let's hit that 5K mark. Oh my gosh, Reba, that is so cool. I have not donated yet to your cause. I was waiting for this exact moment to tell you that I am going to get on that website and donate and I will help you get there. This is so (sighs) awesome that you did this. Thank you. And yeah, we'll post a link on our social media to, to send people that way when this episode comes out. Sammy, thank you so much. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. I should have thought of that one sooner, Reba. Okay, so speaking of this episode coming out, everybody, this is our last episode of this version of this show for a couple of weeks. The NWSL is going on break for the Olympics, as we know. So at the women's game, we're going to pivot our coverage to be Olympics focused as well. There's still going to be like three or four things coming at you every single week. It's going to be Olympics focused and it's not necessarily going to be called good vibes, but it's going to be Becky heavy. We're going to get her booked for every single opportunity that we can (laughs) before we completely transition to Olympics coverage. We actually still have two more episodes of friendlies dropping. Tomorrow's episode is with Viv Miedema. Incredible that we booked her. It was so awesome. I loved chatting with her. And then next Wednesday is with Janine Becky, Canadian and Portland Thorns forward. So stay tuned for more information on all of our Olympics coverage. And we will be sure to let you know when Good Vibes is coming back because I will be really sad every week when we don't do this show. Okay, let's get to the show. Today on the podcast, we are getting Becky's take on the U.S. Women's National Team Olympic roster after the drop last week. We've had a few days to think it through, and you'll get our thoughtful, composed reaction and analysis. We are going to review all things NWSL, and we're really taking a deep dive into this coaching carousel as we approach this big, long international break over the summer. Plus, we'll preview what to expect this summer as the NWSL goes on that break. There are three tournaments to keep you busy all summer long. Before we get into all of that, whew, we are the self-anointed pasta salad, Becky, of women's soccer because it's time to fire up that grill for a holiday barbecue, and this is just a delicious morsel as you get your start to filling up your plate. Love it. I love pasta salad, so well done. I love pasta salad. I want swirly noodles. What are those called? Like rigatoni or elbows with like basically Italian, just Italian dressing from a bottle dumped all over it with like peppers, like green and red peppers. And honestly, like, I don't even know what else. What else belongs in there? Salami, cheese, olives, some Italian seasoning. I mean, you can go ham on that. I just want it to be, like, dripping with, like, Italian dressing. Oh, same. Like, what even? Oh, pasta salad. (laughs) It's so good. Pasta salad. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's get into the soccer, everybody. That's what we're really here for. The U.S. Women's National Team roster drop. Burgers and dogs. This is what you come to the barbecue for. It's what you show up for. This roster dropping, hamburgers, hot dogs. So last week, the U.S. Women's National Team Olympic roster was released. Emma Hayes' first roster naming of her tenure, and it carried all the weight and all the judgment of a new manager. And an Olympics roster is really not an easy place to start a new career, being that it's only 18 players rather than 23 in a World Cup roster. It's just a really hard roster to make. Add on to that, the U.S. recently dropped to fifth in the FIFA rankings, which is the team's lowest ranking ever. And then add on top of that, we still kind of have this lackluster World Cup performance from last year looming over everybody's heads. So Emma had some tough choices to make. I reacted to the roster immediately after it dropped in a quick video on YouTube, but luckily now we have Becky here to weigh in as well. So Becky, first, if it's you as the new manager, you've only been into one camp with these players. You saw those two exhibition matches against South Korea. Where do you even start putting pen to paper to make this selection? I think you start with the players that you're very sure about. And I would say there was probably... 12 to 14 players that she was like, for sure, these players are on my roster. I am going to use these two friendlies against South Korea to look at players I'm not quite sure about and partnerships that I'm not quite sure Mm. about. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Actually, something Lynn talks about a lot with roster selection like this is this idea that let's say Emma was sure about 14 players. 
she may or may not then look at the last four spots and say, I need somebody different than player 12. So I'm going to go with this person instead of this person. And it's not necessarily that not making it means you're a worse player than somebody else. It's a puzzle. It's like putting together the right tools with the right chemistry, the right amount of versatility, the right positions, and that getting cut in this last minute kind of way isn't necessarily a reflection of you and how good you are, but more that this coach needed to complete this puzzle. Yeah. And I've always heard through my years of playing, it's about putting the right 11 on the field, not necessarily the best 11 players. And I think you're right. I think if you're tactically flexible and can fit different tactics, different styles, can play against different competitions and adapt to different teams and their styles, then yeah, I think you have a better shot of making this team. You might be the world's best at one thing and that might not be what the team needs. And if you get cut for that, I do hope those players do, like you said, give themselves grace to know that it's not them necessarily as a player or person. It's just you just weren't the right tool for this toolbox. Like how much did club play factor into this roster? That's a great question. There is a comprehensive scouting system when it comes to watching players in the NWSL. And I think these packages get made for each player and they get sent to Emma. And so I think Emma's seeing these packages that are being sent to her. I don't know how many games she's attended or watched herself, but I know that speaking with Twyla Kilgore, the interim head coach, that you know she's at a lot of games, she's putting together a lot of packages. And so I know there is communication about club play. That makes a lot of sense. And I think the addition of a player like Croy Bethune, who had only been a training player once before in a camp, to now be going as an alternate is a signal to me that club play was considered. Of course, it different things apply to different players, but to include Croy with such little national team experience, even Hal Hirschfeld similarly, like is a signal that a player who's in form and performing well week in and week out should be there. This is new, though, for a manager like Emma. So she's been coaching in the club game for a really long time. What do you think are some of the things that she's thinking about transitioning into a national team setting? I think it's tough because you go from day in, day out development with these players. You get to know them so well. You get to see changes in their form. You can see changes in their personality, their behaviors. And so now you're going from a higher level and you're not as in touch on the day-to-day. Mm -hmm. And so everything has to be more effective and efficient. So mm. communication, the moments that you get together have to be so prioritized because you just don't have that much time together. If you remember, Sammy, we would go into camp and like Don Scott would put onto the screen, you have this many training sessions left, this many meetings left, this many friendlies. And it was always kind of daunting because it's really not a lot. So yeah. for me, if I were transitioning into a national team coach from club coach, it would be like, wow, I need to be so effective with a little bit of time that I have. Yeah. Kind of like my Vermont green coaching experience. Like, wow, I have three days to throw this thing together. <laughs> let's let's be as effective as possible. Well, the glaring headline with this roster, which we are going to get way more in depth into, is that Alex Morgan is not on this roster. We want to run through by position, starting with defense, because my co-host is literally the greatest American center back to ever play the position. So, Becky, I'm going to leave it to you to rattle off this list of defenders. Oh, Sammy, you know you know that's not true, but thanks for saying it anyway. Okay, going with the defenders. I'm kind of going to go with the most experienced to the least experienced. I'm going to start with Emily Sonnet, near 100 caps, which is, as we all know, quite the milestone. You've got Tierna Davidson, Casey Kruger, and Emily Fox with around 50 caps. And then you've got Naomi Gurma and Jenna Nicewanger rounding it out. This, for me... If I had to do a cookout food, this is corn on the cob. This is like <laughs> yeah. at every single cookout, strong, sturdy. You can't go wrong. You can't really mess it up too bad because this defense, I think, is talented, has the right depth and the right experience mm. spectrum to be very successful. Yeah, I feel it's a pretty young defense. I guess that looking at it again, Casey Kruger and Emily Sonnet are really bringing that older player experience. Tierna has also been around for a really long time. Naomi's newer, but Naomi has really established herself as one of the sure starters on this team. What do you think about the what we could predict to be the starting back line with perhaps Naomi and Tierna as center backs paired together? If I were Emma, I would for sure. Tierna and Naomi. And then 
just going off what I've seen the last few years, I would probably go with Foxy and then probably Jenna on the other side, on the left side. I think that would be kind of your starting back line. And I feel really good about the center back pairing. I've played with both of these players in major tournaments, nay, qualifications in 2022 to get to the Olympics, Tierna, World Cup Olympics. So even if this back line is young in age, they are not young in experience. And mm. I just want to make sure that people know that if if mistakes are made, it is not because they are young. It is just a mistake being made on the field. Yeah. Yeah. That, there are corns on the cob out there. Exactly. It's just one kernel. It's not the whole cob. <laughs> okay. I, I've got the midfield. We have Corbin Albert, Sam Coffey, Lindsey Horan, Rose Lavelle, and Katarina Macario, who played for Emma Hayes at Chelsea just this past season. This midfield group, they're my pickles. They could be anything. They could be a topping on a burger. You could eat a, a long pickle on its own. They could be plain pickles. They could be fancy pickles. They could be spicy. They can be simple. Freaking love pickles. Love this midfield. I'm really excited about it. Do you have a prediction as to who you think Emma is going to start in the midfield? If I had to give a prediction, I would go with Sam Coffey at the six. I would say Lindsay Horan and Rose Lavelle. And I think that is a very, very strong trio. I think because we've talked about how difficult the Olympics can be, there will be rotation in there. I think there has to be in order to keep everyone at their best. But that three, I, I would say, was probably going to get the, the most minutes of the tournament. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of versatility in this team as a whole. I think between Sam Coffey, Lindsay, Corbin Albert, and then even Sonnet as potential to play that six, the midfield has a lot of room for rotating, subbing, getting players rest when they need it, and being able to kind of plan for the opponent with, are we going to play a double pivot? Are we going to push that kind of eight higher up the field and create numbers higher. I think tactically it provides for a lot of flexibility, which is very Emma Hayes for me. I have already said what I had to say about the inclusion of Corbin Albert in this roster on my reaction video last week. Basically just that I think if the team wants the public and the fans to embrace her, then they should show publicly the steps that she's taking to kind of be forgiven by the people that she hurt with her actions. I wanted to leave some space, Becky, if you have any thoughts that you want to add. Sammy, I, I've listened to you and I've listened to past players like Kristen Press on what they believe as well. And I agree with you guys. I think she is a public figure and public figures have responsibilities with the words that they use because they carry and words can harm and they can heal and actions can harm and they can heal. And so it's really, do you believe in restorative justice? Do you believe that a person can change? And I would love to see Corbin getting an education and learning about inclusivity and seeing the steps that she's making. Like how great would it be to see that kind of healing for the community that she harmed, that she's trying. And for people who also believe in, in hateful rhetoric and support hateful rhetoric to see somebody who can change and the possibility mm. of change. And this goes so beyond soccer and it's going to be uncomfortable for Corbin if she has to do this. Is this a lot to ask of a 20-year-old? No. You know, I think if she wants to be forgiven genuinely, like put in the work, show that you have the work, there is no growth without struggle. Mm. And if you think about the way that these words hurt trans youth, you know, kids that are just wanting gender affirming support and care and can't because it's criminalized, like all these terrible things that are happening and to see potentially like one of your heroes believing something like that, the hateful rhetoric. And so I would love to see the work that she's, that she's doing. I would love to see athlete ally I know is in kind of early days talks with U S soccer federation with the U.S. Women's National Team Player Association to talk about inclusivity and to provide an education and social media training and all these things because we know that words carry and words can hurt. Yeah. Thank you so much, Becky. I think that your thoughts on this matter will mean a lot to a lot of people. And I just wanted to like retouch on something that you said is that I think that we do at least want to believe in restorative justice and that if somebody does something that was a mistake. There is room for forgiveness as long as they do the work to get there. 
And I think that, like, I, yes, I can sit here and say, yeah, I believe in restorative justice and I want people who make mistakes to have space to grow and learn. But it's also, I don't feel like it's necessarily up to me either. I'm trying to reflect the values of a community that I feel supports me and and I support them. And this is like a really hard situation and I want there to be a resolution, but it's not up to me and it's not up to us. And it's time will tell if there has been learning and time will tell if forgiveness is possible. Okay, Becky, can you read us the forewords? Yes, forwards. And I'll also go from most experienced to least experienced. You've got Crystal Dunn listed as a forward, which is always fun. You got Mal Swanson with the most experience. You've got Sophia Smith with around 50 caps. And then Trinity Rodman and Jaden Shaw filling it out with 38, 14 caps, respectively. And so this is, for me, another good breadth of experience. Mm. I love seeing Crystal in there. I think. I appreciate that she bet on herself. I think we know that she's one of the world's best at outside back. And I can't wait for her to prove to the world that she's also one of the world's best as forward. I know. These forwards for me are potato chips. We've got Uh, all different flavors. They're all fun. They're all delicious. They've all got a little crunch to them. I don't even know. I think these forward, this is the hardest position on this roster to make, in my opinion. I think especially with kind of that Not last minute, but Crystal has changed position over the last couple of months. And her moving to fill a forwards role took that spot, maybe in kind of an unexpected way. At the end of the day, Becky, do you think the starting three, and again, I expect a lot of rotation, but starting the first game, do you think it's Mal, Trinity, and Sophia Smith? If I'm looking at this from being an opponent center back, that's the three that I would least want to go against. So, yeah, I would say end of the day, Mal, Trin, and Soph, you're starting three. Oh, man. It is so exciting. And again, I love the versatility of this group. I think Mal and Jaden Shaw especially are the type of player who almost have midfield tendencies and can drop in and create a double 10. They can turn and dribble out of the midfield. So I'm really, really excited about that. I also want to mention, I think Kat Macario can play as a 10 and can also play as A nine, false nine, and her technical ability in that midfield to combine, hold up the ball, shoot from distance. She's a center of the of the field player. So whether she starts, whether she plays the ten or the nine or kind of whatever she's doing in there, I'm really excited about her as an attacking player. For the forwards, is this the group we expected? Like, I think we're going to get to this again. Alex Morgan being left off is huge news. But do we feel good about this group going into the Olympics? Yeah, I feel good about this group. I think, you know, Alex not being on there. I think Glenn is an alternate. I think she had a real shot of making the active 18. So I I really don't think you can go wrong. I think there's just a plethora of gifted attacking players in the U.S. And I imagine Emma had the hardest time picking this group. I do too. I agree. I think this was the hardest position to be selected for. Goalkeeper, difficult spot to be selected for as well. But we have Casey Murphy and good old Alyssa Nair. So happy to see her in there. Our goalkeepers, they're the catch-up. They're out there. Everybody needs the catch-up no matter what. It's on everybody's plate no matter what. Alternates, we have Jane Campbell in goal. Midfielder, Hal Hirschfeld from the Spirit. Midfielder, Croy Bethune from the Spirit. And then our bestie forward, Lynn Williams, who's on Gotham right now. Thoughts on the alternates, Reba? I will go back to what you said earlier about NWSL form. And in a tournament like the Olympics, like because it's such a crammed, short tournament, being in form is really important. And so I really do love seeing Croy Bethune and Hal Hirschfeld in there because I do think they're in form right now. I think they're confident. I think they're playing with confidence. They're making the people around them better. And so if their number is called and they have to fill out the 18 for whatever reason, I do feel comfortable with them going in, especially because sometimes when you don't have any caps, you don't really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You just play so free because you just don't know any better. Like You you do not have to be a battle-hardened grizzly veteran in these tournaments to play well. And sometimes it's actually a disadvantage because you just know things can go the wrong yeah. way. So <laughs> yeah. if if they were to have to play, I, I feel very comfortable with them. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. The alternates, they're the popsicles. They're in the freezer. 
but they are ready anytime. This was, I was most proud of this one. I thought the pop skulls in the freezer, but they're ready to go out. Genius. Love that one. Okay, one quick question about this though, Becky, about the alternates. In 2021, the roster got expanded from 18 to 22. So the four alternates were told that they were alternates, but then we arrived at the tournament and then they were like, nope, you're actually on the team. Have you heard anything about the IOC potentially changing that rule again? Is there any chance this roster gets expanded to 22? From what I have heard, I think it was asked by some of the federations to get it to 22, whereas other federations thought that, no, they would prefer to have just the 18. And this was strategic because maybe you don't feel like your team has as much depth as, let's Mm. say, the United States or Australia. And so you want your 18 as opposed to having to compete against USA's 22. So I think ultimately the IOC has stayed with the traditional 18 rosters with the four alternates. Do you think that they should expand it? Yeah, I absolutely think it should be expanded. I think the amount of games, travel, and training that you have to do throughout the year, let alone in the Olympics, is enough where player safety have, has to come into account. Yeah. And so I think having more people on the roster and allowing for a little bit of rotation is a player safety issue. And so I yeah. say, yeah, for sure. I agree with you. I think 18 is so small and like so much credit to any Olympic team that's ever gotten through on 18. It's like so impressive. But I think 22 is better for the quality of the game, the safety of the players, a lot of reasons. We finally arrived at the elephant in the room. We have to talk about Alex Morgan, longtime U.S. Women's National Team veteran, being left off this roster. For the first time since 2008, the U.S. Women's National Team will play a tournament without Alex Morgan. How do you feel when you hear me say that, Becky? It makes me sad. It's like wild. It's sad. It's an end of the era. I thought she was going to be on it. So I was as shocked as everybody else when I saw that announcement. And I think Alex is a winner. I have won so many things because I've been on a team with players like Alex. She's ultra competitive. She does not crumble when it comes to the most high pressure moments like World Cups and Olympics and qualifiers. And She provides something in game that I'm excited to see who will fill in this new roster. Alex could adapt to a game state better than any forward I've ever played with. Whatever we needed, she could become. Say we're protecting a lead. Alex was a player that I could just clear a ball without even looking and know that she's going to battle, either go up for a header to Mm. win it, collect it, give us time to advance up the field, go to the corner, pick up fouls, like these little things that win you games and tournaments and can save legs, Alex could do that. So I'm, I'm excited to see who with this new forward group is going to fill that role. Yeah, I am too. I First and foremost, like I feel for Alex. I think somebody like her being left off a roster, of course, that's got to hurt. I do think the team is left with this opportunity for a leader. And like you're saying, Becky, somebody to kind of step up and fill in and be that person on and off the field to take the brunt of whatever is needed of them. So Emma said, looking through the cap accumulation of the team, there's been a lack of development of putting some of the less experienced players in positions where they can develop that experience. I think it's important that we do that to take the next step. So I'm not looking backwards. I think this was really interesting coming from Emma talking about bringing along some of these younger, less capped players to this world tournament Maybe she has one eye on the future, on the on the next World Cup. What did you make of this comment and this whole roster of younger players? Yeah, it's just different, Sammy, isn't it, from our own experience? I mean, you talk about 2015 and 2019, and I think the average age was mostly around 30, whereas I think this roster for the Olympics is like 26. So I think it's Emma just showing that she's going to do things differently from the coaches of the program in the past. And maybe that's what we need. You know, like we were successful in 2019, but then didn't do great in Tokyo Olympics. We got bronze, which is less than what we wanted, but still pretty good. Then we had 2023 where we weren't as successful as we wanted to be. So maybe something needs to be shaken up, you know, like as a a player with over 200 caps, I, I do think there is something about experience. I think that is needed. And I think it helps bring along players faster than if you just kind of 
throw them into the to the deep end. And I think that's happening. I think there are players on this Olympic roster that do have the experience to help the less experienced. And so I still think it is a, a pretty good breadth of age and experience level. Yeah, I agree. It was it was actually really cute. I was talking to Rose right around when the roster got named. And you know how some of the older and well-connected players would always like get us little gifts and leave us like beats or like headphones or something cool on our spots in the equipment room. Rose was like, me and Sonnet are like trying to do that for everybody. And like <laughs> we stepped up and like we made a dinner reservation for all of us. And I just thought it was so cool to see players that I are my peers in those positions of leadership. And I think players like that learned from you and from Alex and from Pino and from Preston Tobin and all those incredible players how to lead. And now is their opportunity and I'm really excited to see it. One other player that got left off that I wanted to just mention is young Lily Johannes. Emma Hayes said this about Lily. Lily was a consideration for this roster, but at this moment, Lily hasn't made a decision about her future. And I support that. I'm super interested in this. This is kind of all we know, but we do know that Lily is eligible for both the U.S. and for the Netherlands. And I'm curious if it was Emma's decision or Lily's decision, but I realize <laughs> I'm just speculating. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard not to speculate. I, as such a young player, it kind of reminds me when you were in high school and all these colleges were trying to get you to commit so early and you're like, I don't know if I want to go to this college in three years. Like, it's such an important decision. And I hope that both federations are kind of giving her the time to really think about who she wants to represent. And because the Dutch aren't in the Olympics, I don't think there's that much pressure coming from that side. And so maybe it's, I think it's great if the U.S. is the one that's kind of like, okay, we're not sure if you were going to make the Olympic roster or not. So we're not going to try to get a definite answer out of you right now. We're not going to cap tie you in any way. So take your time, like let this decision be the right decision. I don't know. That's that's where my head went. I know. Not to go way deep down this rabbit hole because we do have to move on, but I don't even think the Olympics is a cap tying process because it's not a FIFA tournament. Oh. Isn't that interesting? I've been reading up about this one, Becky. All, all I do is sit here and read articles about Lily Ohana has apparently... I mean, do your job, but that's fascinating. Then there's really no pressure. Uh, yeah, I know. I thought that one was really interesting. Always, anyway, just wishing Lily the best of luck. Um, I'm sure that she's going to be on a, a senior team someday, whether it's the U.S. or the Netherlands, and she'll have plenty of opportunities to go to the Olympics. So back to the U.S. In our Olipop Gut Check of the Week, Becky, it's finally time. This is brought to you by our freaking homies over at Olipop. Reba, after all this cookout talk, what's the best cookout food? And who on the U.S. Olympic roster do you want to cook it for you? Ooh, the best. I think, <laughs> like you said, at the top, it's the meat of the barbecue. I want a really good cheeseburger. Mm. You know what we really haven't like mentioned much yet, but we're probably going to mention it later, is a little dessert action. Oh, absolutely. You know, like a trifle? I can't picture it in my head, no. It's like the thing in the glass dish with like the cake and the cream and the cookies and the cake and the berries and the cream and the oh and it's okay. in a glass dish yeah 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 yeah. i love that okay. who do you want cooking your meat on the grill oh this this is the easiest part of this question that's Alyssa. i mean she's oh my god duh she's probably got like a multi-thousand dollar traeger that she's just gonna get ready and just start grilling everything and you know she's gonna have the best beer selection so i think an all-around cookout environment is definitely Alyssa. Alyssa Nair, number one on my list of invited guests to a cookout. Who do I want making me a little trifle? Honestly, maybe like Naomi. I That's where I went. Yeah. I, I Honestly, do I know why? I just think that she would like pay attention to detail. She would be patient with the layers and she'd make it real tasty. Yeah, I could see that. I would also say Tierna as well because I think she would be super analytical about it and like each layer would be like scientifically the same Measured. millimeter. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, um, Alyssa, Naomi, and Tierna, congratulations. You're invited to be in Becky's cookout. Olipop is also invited. Thank you guys so much. Make sure to comment below what you want as your cookout food and who you want from this roster to cook it for you. No promises that we could ever make that happen, but if we ever could, I would try. All right, we want to give... Some top lines from the games this weekend. And then we really want to get into all these coaching changes. So let's start quickly with what happened this weekend. Temwa Chewinga scored two goals for Kansas City. Kansas City? Kansas City. <laughs> Beating Houston 2 to nothing. 
Kansas City now have a record 17-game unbeaten streak, and they're at the top of the table with 35 points. Orlando won 3 to nothing over Angel City, and they are also unbeaten this season. They are also on 35 points. But it might not stay tied for long, and we might not still have two unbeaten teams at the end of the weekend because Kansas City and Orlando are playing each other this weekend, Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. I'm pretty excited about this game, Becky. Who do you think is going to win? Well, I hope it's not lame and they tie and they just continue their unbeaten record. Like, let's get a winner. And if I, I had know. to go with somebody, it'd be Orlando. I'm I'm wanting Orlando. I don't know. It's like hot dogs versus brats. Which I one know. is better? What brats. do you think, Sammy? You, brats? Brats. Brats. There you go. I'm freaking here for a sausage in a bun with a little mustard on it. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner. <laughs> also, though, like, throw me a freaking hot dog. Oh, anytime. I'll three bite it, you know? (laughs) Okay, so who do you have winning? I might have Kansas City, baby. Okay, I like that. But I also like can't imagine that it'll be like a three to three tie. (laughs) Oh, it'd be like eight to eight, but sure. I know, you heard it here first. Moving on, Ashley Sanchez scored on and beat her former club, the Spirit, one to nothing. The Courage finally finding an away win and the Spirit... Falling, actually, with their new coach, Jonathan Geraldo's watching. We'll get into that in a sec. Rose Lavelle scored again for Gotham, but then they end up dropping the two points, conceding a last-minute own goal to the Seattle Reign, who did get a well-earned point, but they are still very far down the table in 13th. I, like, couldn't believe it for Gotham when that ball went in their own goal because they were just hanging on. Don't, I don't know. I felt really bad for them. And then the Casey stony wave lost to Chicago 3 to nothing, And that's a good jumping-off point for what we want to talk about today, and that's the coaching carousel. We know the NWSL is a chaos league, but recently it hasn't just been the scorelines. Several head coaches, team presidents, GMs, and internal staff have experienced a shakeup in the last few weeks. We wanted to get into the heart of what's happening here. Let's start with the headlines. This weekend, after a 0-0 draw with your Portland Thorns, Becky, Utah Royals head coach Amy Rodriguez, along with President Michelle Hinsick and goalkeeper coach Mary's Bard Martell, were all relieved of their duties. Utah have been in dead last all season, so this turn of events is not necessarily a shock, but it's a new club. They still have 14 games left to play. They did just win a couple weeks ago. I'm so curious, Becky. I know you're, you've are you been friends with A-Rod for a long time. I feel like this job was such a huge undertaking. How do you think this has all gone for her? It was a tough situation to come into. It's an expansion team. It's new. You're putting together a roster. A-Rod had volunteer or assistant coach at USC. So she had some coaching experience, but being like the head coach, it's it's a different beast, I think. And I think she kind of had a rotating cast of assistant coaches around her. So nothing that really stayed permanent. And so I think it was just, like you said, a very tough undertaking at first. And I'm so proud of A-Rod. I've known her since we were teenagers. I love that she has stayed around the game and that she became the head coach of an NWSL franchise. I think that's so great. And I hope I see this in the future. And unfortunately, this journey did not go her way. I sincerely hope we see her again in the future because I think she has so much to offer. And yeah, I think it was a tough go. And we just played them, like you said, and it was a good game. You know, like they really battled hard and that's a team that will win games. And do I wish she could have had a little bit more time for that to coalesce and become even stronger? Yeah, I do wish she had more time. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, I recognize this is not the same thing at all, but I think when I was just recently coaching this Vermont Green team, I kind of realized on game day, like, oh my God, if we lose, like I put myself out here to coach this team. And if I fail, that's a reflection on me. So I think that it was so brave of A-Rod to take this, what seems like a huge step and come be the head coach of an NBCL team. She's obviously totally qualified. She was a world-class player. It's a courageous thing to do to take that kind of responsibility on. So I wish her the best of luck moving forward and hopefully she will continue to be a part of the NBCL. I think that there is coaching changes as we're going to get to happening in a lot of places right now. And maybe it just wasn't the right fit at the right time. Also this week, Casey Stoney, the San Diego Wave manager who helped them win the Shield last season, was let go from her position as well. And we actually got an email about it from Rob S. from San Diego. He said, I live in San Diego. I'm a huge NWSL fan of the Wave and the league. 
The wave just fired Casey Stoney. I simply do not understand the reasoning. She wins the Shield, Coach of the Year, Challenge Cup. Then the team underperforms this year, and she's canned midseason. How does it make any sense to fire such a clearly qualified, if not one of the best coaches in the women's game? I know this is a common theme in football where coaches who do great one year are unceremoniously dismissed the next when their teams struggle. Please help me to understand I thought Casey was a really exceptional coach. A little bit of background on Casey. She's the Waves' inaugural head coach. She won Coach of the Year in 2022. The team won the NWSL Shield in 2023 in only their second year existing. Then they turn around and win the Challenge Cup earlier this season. She's been with the team since their start. Becky, do you think this was unfair to fire her now? I I don't know if it was unfair. I think it's very surprising. I think there is kind of this theme in the game where you find a lot of success and then there's this kind of hangover that next year. Mm. And maybe it's the disease of more or, you know, where players are kind of expecting more from the coaching staff or expecting more playing time. And it's hard to manage everybody and people get unhappy and then performances go down. It could also be accumulation of like physical load. Like you played all through the season, you played well, you played hard, you go into the playoffs, so you're not getting that much of a break. So a lot of things can play into a team's form dipping. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the easiest change to make, because you can't really change your roster up, like that's super difficult. There's all these, you know, bylaws in the CBA and transfer windows and stuff, and there's money and salary caps, that the easiest thing to change is the coach. And I'm wondering if that's what's happened in the situation. I find that really interesting. And I want to get to your experience with the coaching change this season. But before we do, Jill Ellis, who we both played for, president of San Diego, obviously had to address this with a statement. She said, I think results and statistics certainly give us information. Currently, we're 17 points out of first place and we're over halfway through the season. We're an ambitious club. We want to compete both domestically and internationally. And she's referring to the CONCACAF Champions League. So where they're sitting right now, San Diego's opportunities are being limited. It's Jill also went on to say it's not only about the numbers. It's also about how it looks, how it feels, and how it performs. She went on to say it was a really hard decision. I'm interested in the idea of like, are we missing something? Is something going on at San Diego that Casey Stoney was let go? Or is it purely that having three wins halfway through the season isn't enough wins. And it was a purely this, like, we're not winning games and this isn't personal and this isn't any issues going on. It's just, we need to be winning games. And like you said, Becky, sometimes the answer is to just change the coach. Yeah, well, I certainly don't have any tea on this situation. So I anything I say would be pure speculation. Well, you know that we are not here for pure speculation, but you can lean on some experience that you had earlier this season when Portland head coach Mike Norris transitioned to a different role in the club after your team didn't get off to the best start. How does this feel as a player? How does it affect you? Are these shifts just part of the role, part of the job, part of the process? Yeah, and I think it's becoming more and more prevalent where you're seeing these coaches change mid-season. Like, usually it's kind of post-season and it get quietly gets a press release out and then Nobody really pays attention to it until the start of preseason. So it's interesting that these changes are happening sooner now, more abrupt. I would say that with Mike Norris and the transition to Rob Gale becoming our interim head coach, a change was needed. Kind of in that quote, Jill mentioned the feel of it, the performance of the team, like it all combines to create the environment. And so we we needed something like we did not have a win to our name. So we needed something to change. And the decision was to bring in someone else to helm the team. And Rob's personality and the injection of energy that he put into the group was what we needed. And we went on a Thorns historic win streak. And Mm. so you never know what like that winning combination can be. And sometimes, unfortunately, it is bringing in a new coach or a new staff. And it's a scary situation because Rob, for us right now, is an interim. You know, we there might be a hiring for our head coach and they might come in, you know, two weeks from now. Like, and that is disruptive for sure. You know, some people are going to be wanting to keep Rob. Some people are going to be hoping that the grass is greener on the other side. And so it's really down back down to team culture and like taking these things in stride and always wanting the team to be the most successful. So being team Mm -hmm. first, no matter who is heading it, 
like everyone doing the right thing for the right reasons. So I guess we're going to, we'll see with San Diego. I know. Well, you bringing up the potential of a coach coming in when a team is doing well is exactly what's happening at the Washington Spirit. They're in third place. They're doing well. But Jonas and Geraldes is coming in right now to take over for Adrian Gonzalez. He arrived a few weeks ago, and he's planning on taking over kind of during this NWSL break. Jonas and Geraldes was the coach at Barcelona who won back-to-back Champions League titles, one of the most prolific and prestigious coaches in the women's game right now. He didn't technically take over before the Spirit just lost on Saturday to the Courage, but I'm really, really interested, Becky, in this idea that a team's doing well and they're having this change anyway because it was predetermined. What do you think that's going to be like for the team, for the Spirit, and for Jonathan Geraldes to, like, I don't want to rock the boat, I don't want to change too much, but I'm here now to coach? I think Jonathan is in a very interesting situation because, <laughs> like you said, like, the Spirit are doing great, very successful, smart strategically of him to take over after the Olympic break, because I think that gives him eight weeks of implementing things that he wants to implement. So don't just like enter, be like, here I am, and just completely rock the boat because the group is doing so well. So I think it's very smart of him to take a little bit of time to dip his toes into the water and get like a feel for the environment, because I think the best leaders can read the room Mm. and be able to adapt to what the room needs. Totally. I think that's really, really insightful. They will have some like summer games, but they'll also be missing some of their players who are away at the Olympics. So I think it's a really interesting and potentially difficult time to come in. Um, But I think that Jonathan Geraldes is clearly up to the challenge. He's been such a successful coach. And I actually just got to listen to this interview that Raj did with Jonathan just last week. It dropped yesterday on our podcast feed and on our YouTube channel. So if you want more insight into the back-to-back Champions League winning manager, Jonathan Geraldes, head over to either this podcast feed or to our YouTube channel and check out that interview. Okay, are you sad because this weekend is the last weekend of the NWSL until August? Well, don't be, because there is so much soccer ahead for all of us. We want to break down all of the tournaments coming up over this eight-week NWSL break. Becky, take it away. Well, first up, we have the Liga MX Tournament. Going back to the cookout, this is chips and guac. Everybody loves it. Everybody wants to eat it right now. It's the best. Yes. The tournament, it features all 14 NWSL teams and the six teams with the most points in Liga MX. We, the Portland Thorns, are in a group with Seattle, Utah, and Tijuana, and super excited for this. Do you get to go to Tijuana? We don't. No, unfortunately, we're hosting Tijuana. Dang. All right. Well, so these group stage games start on Friday, July 19th, which is very soon, everybody. And they'll run through Friday, August 2nd. Then there are five groups and only the top four teams. So the group winners with the most points will advance to the semifinals, which are on Tuesday, August 6th at CPKC Stadium in Kansas City. Then the final will be played two months later. The NWSL is going to resume in the meantime. The final will be played on October 25th at Toyota Field in San Antonio, Texas. So Becky, we know that your Portland team is playing in this tournament. What's your approach? Like, My question here is, is this an opportunity for starters to stay sharp and fit over the Olympics break? Or is this one of those tournaments where it's actually a good time to get your starters some rest and give some lower minute players the opportunity to show what they can do? Oh, I think it's a combination of having your players that are high minutes tick over, but then also giving wonderful experience to your lower minute players. And most of the teams in the NWSL are, are missing some players for this Olympic break. And so I think it's just a great opportunity to give that experience to lower minute players. But it is really important for those high minute players to continue to like physically load yeah. and just to to tick over in that form. Like we all know form can, it's a fickle thing. It can definitely ebb and flow. And if you do not play in competitive games, it will ebb for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, There's another tournament that will provide a similar opportunity for some NWSL teams. This is the CONCACAF Champions Cup, a.k.a. the Good Vibes CONCA Champions Invitational. This tournament is like Aunt Susie's chocolate chip cookies. She only made one batch. You're like, Aunt Susie, like there's 50 people here. You brought 12 cookies. You got to race. You got to get it before somebody else does. They're elite. It's a much smaller tournament than the NWSL and Liga MX tournament. It's only 10 teams with only three NWSL teams, Gotham, San Diego, and our old Portland Thorns. 
Group stage week one is the weekend of August 20th. This competition extends into 2025 with the semifinals and third place match and final being held next May. It's a longer tournament because this tournament serves as the qualification process for the Club World Cup, which will take place in early 2026. So this tournament has like real stakes to it. How exciting is the introduction of an elite level tournament like this? Oh, I'm I am stoked. Can you imagine playing in a Club World Cup like the best club teams in the world like that? I want to be there. I want to be playing in that tournament. That's, like, so cool. I, well, this is actually something that Jill Ellis specifically targeted in her statement about letting Casey Stoney go. She said, our goal is to be a part of that international competition, and with the way we're playing right now, maybe that's not in the cards. So do you think that Portland is really looking at this tournament as an opportunity to establish themselves as one of the best clubs globally, not just domestically? Oh, very much so. And it just aligns perfectly with our new ownership, with their Mm. values. Like they want the Portland Thorns to be a global brand. And to do that, like you also have to be damn good at playing soccer. And so being in this tournament, you know, hopefully we qualify and do well and make it there. But that is something that we want very much. That is very exciting. I'm a little bit jealous, but I'll be covering it all, Becky. I'll be here watching, taking notes. You better believe it. And then the third big tournament this summer, obviously, it's the Olympics. The games kick off on July 25th, and it's going to get wild from there. But please don't worry. We're going to have a bunch of podcasts. We're going to have live post-game shows scheduled throughout the tournament. Uh, We also have some very special interviews with two U.S. Women's National Team Olympic rostered players coming for you all very soon. The Women's Game is your go-to place for all of the Olympics content you could ever want. You can follow along with us on social media so you don't miss anything. While you're at it, please subscribe to our podcast feed and YouTube channel. And Becky is going to join us and be a part of our Olympics coverage. Oh, yeah, I am. This is it. This is the end of Good Vibes, but it's just for a few weeks and we're going to be back. Please don't worry about it. I am going to miss everybody. So I want to leave everybody with a good, a couple good vibes, Reba. Mine this week is a little nerdy. So I kind of go through phases of watching shows, reading, or gaming. And lately I've been gaming and I'm playing this game and it's getting progressively more and more difficult where one screen, I will die 15 times trying to complete it to get to just the next room. But I tell you what, when you figure out that puzzle or you figure out how to get to that next screen, it just feels so good. That sense of accomplishment, it's like almost learning a new skill in soccer yeah. and then doing it in the next game and being like, wow, what a sense of accomplishment. So that yeah. that's my good vibe, a sense of accomplishment. Oh, I love that. That's a really, really good one. Mine is just uh, an ice maple latte. No, I'm just kidding, you guys. I know I already did that so many times. Mine this week is just cornbread. Like, I, I've just kind of been thinking about cornbread a lot, and we were, like, talking about cookouts, and I'm just I'm kind of like, I just, cornbread is just such a good vibe that I just love. And, like, this is what I'll do when I make cornbread, Reba. I, like, don't serve myself a piece. I, like, bring the pan over to the couch and I keep taking little tiny bites and I'm like, okay, I can have a quarter of this. Okay. I can have three eighths of this. And then eventually I eat three quarters of the pan and -hmm. then I eat the rest the next day. It's like one of my literal favorite foods in the whole world. Can I ask you some questions about this cornbread? Sure. Do you put jalapenos in your cornbread? No. Do you eat it with butter? Yes. Do you eat it with honey butter? Sure. Okay. I feel like I better understand you now. Great follow-up questions. I hope that they cut that into a promo because I thought that was pretty funny. (laughs) Um, That's it for this week's episode of Good Vibes FC. Please be subscribed. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe right now, you little dunkaroo. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. We're on YouTube. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on TikTok. We're on threads now, Reba. Have you seen? I haven't. I don't even know what that is, but I will look into it. Look into it. Look into it, Reba. Coming up this week, it's actually tomorrow, everybody. We have an interview with Viv Miedema, the Netherlands and former Arsenal striker. We talk about her time at Arsenal coming to an end. We talk about her very cute dog that she shares with her partner, Beth Mead Miley. We talk about the Taylor Swift concert at Wembley. I ask her what team she is going to sign for, so you don't want to miss this episode. It is out on Wednesday this week instead of Thursday, because maybe we're all going to be at a cookout on Thursday. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye. I'm Becky. And I'm Sam Ewis, and this is Good Vibes FC. 
the podcast that's like a cold beer at a barbecue. It just hits the freaking spot. Love you. Goodbye. Bye.